For the past few months, I have been obsessing over a new Disney animated show that revolves around a charismatic, bubbly Dominican-American human girl who gets isekai'd into a magical world with no means of being able to return home unless she becomes an apprentice to a wanted, yet sexy, criminal owl lady who occasionally transforms into a terrifying owl monster due to an incurable curse. It's filled with charming writing, lovely animation, delightful characters, quick wit, beautiful set pieces and colour schemes, and a little bit of gayness splashed into it. So prepare yourselves, get your buttocks comfy, your earphones in, and sit back as you listen to me explain just why the Owl House is so fun to watch. Alright, let's see this mess. Having released only this year as one of Disney's newest shows, the Owl House provides some of the most refreshing entertainment I've had watching a TV show in a while. In all honesty, I've had an absolute blast with a lot of Western animation these past few years, with Hilda, She-Ra, Kippo, Amphibia, Adventure Time, Steven Universe, Harley Quinn, Craig of the Creek, and many more. It's been an outright joy being a TV animation fan, and that's before even getting into anime. The Owl House just fulfills so many familiar tropes and emotions that I absolutely love when watching a project, and bundles them up nicely into a show that demonstrates the creativity that can happen when a team of skillful visionaries come together to produce something memorable. And trust me, the team behind the camera seemed just as lovable as the show. The story follows Luz Naceda, a non-magical being who transports into a hellscape realm also known as the Boiling Isles. It's filled with the wonders of any fictional hell setting, with monsters and demons being the norm. Give me your skin! <laughs> it's the perfect place for somebody like Luce, who back in the human realm was considered a... looser, and wasn't able to fit in, but was obsessed with the story The Good Witch Azura, conveniently a novel about a powerful witch using her power for the greater good. Which leads us to one of the main premises of the Owl House, with witches and magic being prominent in the land, it makes sense that the ever endearing and inspired Luce wants to be able to cast magic much like her idol Azura. Only one teeny tiny issue. I want to stay and become a witch like you and Azura. What? All right, that's crazy. Humans can't become witches. But of course, with a little bit of main character drive plus an adorable resolve, Luce only sees this issue as a welcoming challenge. Humans can't become witches. Maybe that's because they haven't tried. Thus leading us on the daily life of Luz Naceda, the very slowly, yet passionately, learning apprentice witch who is taken under the wing of Ida, the Owl Lady, the most powerful witch of the land, and her cute little dog, uh, <coughs> uh, sorry, sorry, I mean, uh, incredibly furious, terrifying, soul-shakingly scary companion, King. Each episode in itself becomes an adventure slapped with some horror-themed imagery and hilarious dialogue. Dumb kids? Wait. Those are my dumb kids! Watching Luce go on adventures and learning the new ways of life as a witch, and finally being able to actually make friends who support her whilst maybe gaining an enemies-to-lovers-trope relationship with a certain dyed green-haired dramatic rival, who just so happens to be the top student of Hexide the magical school where Luce starts to attend. Dana Terrace, the creator and executive producer of the show, was inspired by her real-life friend Luce for the creation of the bubbly main character we all know and love. In fact, the real-life Luce in question also coincidentally works on the Owl House as a story artist and consultant. Basing some of the character off a real-life person allows Luce to feel like a much more grounded and authentic character. We're able to take this unknowing and terrifying world from the experiences of a main character who is also new to this environment, learning the peculiar rules and ways of the land and the strange people who populate it. Dana mentioned herself that The Boiling Isles is inspired by the likes of Hieronymus Boss, John Bauer and Remedios Varo's work. Boss is known for his infamous large paintings that divide audiences' views with unusually symbolic and often biblically charged hell-formed landscapes, where creepy animals chaotically fill the painting's environments and give a sense of unease. 
Bauer, on the other hand, gets us up close and personal to these otherworldly beings, often folklore and fairy tale inspired illustrations that reek of an eeriness that leaves viewers either unsettled or intrigued. Whilst Varro produced paintings that were much more surrealist, multiple stories told in a single image that flow with symbolic narratives reinforced by strong compositions and colour schemes consistent with fiery oranges complementing darker, cold palettes. Of course, this being a cartoon television show aimed towards kids, the Owl House team understandably have to tone down a bit of the imagery for the sake of not scarring kids for the rest of their lives. However, I'd argue they balance this tricky conundrum very well through having great background artists on board to illustrate the Boiling Isles as a place that, whilst still frightening, is an exciting opportunity to get lost in the weirdness and oddity of an unfamiliar realm that Disney television animation had yet to present. A world where what most people would perceive to be creepy, weird and a cause for judgement can be seen as fascinating and cool the perfect analogy for Luz herself. A girl who was continuously judged for her weird behaviour on Earth is able to express herself much more freely in a land that's filled with strange. It's a great way to show to kids that no matter how many people may judge you for your weird hobbies and antics, there's also a great bunch of people who will also accept them. And this message becomes much more special and vital to kids, and adults too, when you consider Dana herself confirmed that Luce is bisexual. I honestly can't express the true joy and happiness I feel knowing that children growing up in these times have these shows for them, from Steven Universe, Legend of Korra, Adventure Time, she Kippo, and now The Owl House. You going soft on me, Blight? <laughs> in your dreams. It's such a great and much needed step forward into showing kids a more realistic representation of, well, life. That it's completely fine if you're a girl and you might like other girls, or you're a boy and you like other boys, or if you're like Luce and you like both. And what better way to demonstrate that than through the analogy Dana has created in this endearing series. As Alex Hirsch, the voice actor of King and this, monstrosity, told it himself in an interview with NewsGeek. There is sometimes a concern with family networks for what is considered family friendly, because Disney is such a big company that in certain corners, they say that maybe they don't want to take those risks. Walt Disney took those risks, and that's why we are sitting in this building. You have to remind yourself that Disney is the full spectrum of emotions, creatures and scary things. The Owl House doesn't just consist of the Boiling Isles. The inhabitants of this decaying demon body are just as vital to the narrative and really bring the magic of the story to life. We have our main character, Luce. For the honor of Greystone! Oh, wait, no, sorry. <clears throat> Wrong gay show. By the power of Skullgar! Our favourite Dominican-American, slightly oblivious teen who loves to make lame puns You bred my mind! <laughs> yes! Bread puns! edits anime clips to music and throws finger guns around like no one's business. The writing team behind this series are really able to show the likability of Luce and how her endearing personality brushes off on the surrounding characters and us the viewers. It's very easy to create a gung-ho, or as Luce would understand, Genki main character that becomes predictable in their actions. But Luce never comes across that way. She's determined, sure, and she might be the only person living in the Owl House with a more positive morale overall, but she's also young and does things sometimes impatiently and creates hilarious and entertaining scenarios through her own odd personality that fits perfectly into the chaos of this world. If we look into her character design alone, we can grab so much detail into the quirks of her character. Trainers with no laces, convenient for a character who would probably never tie her laces, and let's be honest, this girl does not need the trouble of laces. A loose crop top that allows her to move around freely and express herself with the big arm motion she does constantly which also notably turns into an adorable cat hoodie, showing off that dorky side she has. And then her shorter hair, which Dana gives a funny explanation for. 
Luce, uh, Luce used to have longer hair, but the more I developed her personality and her character, the more I was like, this is the kind of girl who's going to try to cut her own hair in the bathroom mirror, and she's going to mess it up. So that's how I came up with her little pixie cut. And of course, her slightly darker skin tone being an indication of her Caribbean Latina roots, representation of which is very sparse, even outside of Disney. All of this in combination with the circular and rounded features of her head and face compared to the sharper shapes used on Ida and King, gives off a softer and more innocent character design feel, showcasing her youthfulness and kindness. Character design for children's television can often come under fire for having too simplistic designs. However, character design and character design for animation are two completely separate identities, in an interview with Brit & Co, Rachel Vine, a story editor and head writer for The Owl House, gave some insights towards the behind-the-scenes magic of the show. Hundreds of hours are spent writing, designing, boarding, tweaking, animating and revising a single episode. The vast number of people who work on just one episode is mind-boggling. I think it's so easy to relegate animation, particularly animation produced for kids, to gags and jokes and toy marketing, but it truly is art. Character design for children's animation has to be kept simple for multiple reasons. First and foremost, simplicity is what makes it quote unquote easier for animators. Now, that doesn't mean scrapping a character design down to its bare minimum, it means strategically choosing which dominant and purposeful visual information to keep, and getting rid of designs or concepts that bring nothing to the table, or perhaps would be too troublesome to animate in such a short deadline timeframe. And this creative way of thinking is perfectly exemplified with King. From the concept art that Dana, Alex and Marina had drawn towards the beginning of the project, it's clear to see that King had a much more menacing visual approach. The horns on his head were more protruding, the colour of his eyes were more demanding, and his mouth opened as he spoke. These concepts aren't in any ways bad, but as Dana explains herself, he was hard to draw. Yeah, when I first designed him, I didn't necessarily think like, oh, he'll never open his mouth. But as I started like drawing his turnaround and, and preparing him for animation, I realised this is really hard to draw. He's just not going to open his mouth. <laughs> and it made it easier for everyone on the crew. And when you're completing designs and animations for such short turnovers, the last stresses you want to add to the visual creatives are designs that are too complicated and take more time to complete. In fact, on the contrary, simpler shapes and lines can make for more freedom when animating. Rebecca Sugar, who I'm sure we all recognise as the creator of Steven Universe, explained their reasonings for a very similar approach. The point of the simpler models is that they allow for flexibility and inconsistency, which is what we want. We want the artists to be able to push the characters in different directions freely, without being distracted by tracking the superfluous details of an over-complex design. And simplifying is just what the Owl House did. If we compare King's concepts to finals, we can see the decisions of simplifying his design whilst keeping familiar iconography that even children will recognise and learn, such as the pet collar, fluffy tail and school head, which all still makes for a unique character silhouette. Meaning, if we were to place him amongst other members of the cast as a silhouette, we'd still be able to identify him. And even something as straightforward as a character's eye shape and colour can easily be a visual identifier when working with simple designs, as the Owl House proves by having an entire episode dedicated to the main three characters body swapping. Everything about the characters is the exact same, apart from the recognisable eyes, which allowed even younger audiences to gauge which character swapped into whose body. It's a simple design choice, but works really effectively because of how they stripped the Owl House characters' designs down to their main visual cues. A really great and fun way of showing the importance of communication through design. However, whilst character design is absolutely vital to an animated show, it's also the well-written dialogue and scenes with said characters that pulls things together, and the writing for this series is just so superbly done. I'll be back soon. Close call. What? Nothing. As far as animated TV goes, 
I've found that the Owl House has great replay value due to the writer's successes in utilising solid world building, along with a cast of characters that are extremely memorable and fleshed out. The show follows events within an episodic fashion rather than sequential, allowing for the writers of each episode an individual chance to bring something new to Lusna Seda's life. For me personally, the writing in the Owl House has three major strengths – its use of comedy, its character dynamics, and character development. The comedy in this show genuinely makes me laugh out loud. Okay, okay. I'm picking up what you're putting down. I'm not putting anything down. The comedic timing, in combination with the often hilarious blunt one-liners that are always wonderfully blended with hilarious facial expressions, make for an onslaught of laughs which completely juxtaposes and balances out the horror element to the story. I couldn't tell you just how many times I've had to pause the show due to laughing at one of Ida's trouble-loving comments. Just when I thought I couldn't respect the law any less, it surprises me. Character dynamics and development, however, often come hand in hand. <laughs> see what I did there? And this show delivers wonderfully in giving audiences relationships that are so bittersweet. I'm an absolute sucker for the found family trope, and the relationship between Ida, King and Luce is an amalgamation of three disorderly misfits who don't truly belong, and coming together to form perhaps the worst combination of people the Boiling Isles could ask for. And yet, we couldn't ask for anything better. Between seeing the loving friendship of Luce and King blossom over the series, and Ida warming up to the little human she randomly came across, it's rewarding to see the developments of their dynamics change over the series so naturally, much like Luce's interactions with her school friends, Willow and Gus, who also make for fun interactions. Of course, I can't mention character dynamics and development without talking about a specific green-haired, highly regarded top student, torturously gay-pining witch, Amity Blight. If Amity saw that, I saw that! There is nothing more fun and entertaining to watch than seeing a character that started off extremely closed off and emotionally guarded, who makes a point of being orderly and organised, falling and one-sidedly yearning for a character who is the complete antithesis of what you'd expect from her archetype. Me? On a team with you? <laughs> Running around in cute uniforms? <laughs> Sweating? I gotta go! What's even funnier is that Luce the Oblivious would absolutely love this gay tier enemies to lovers trope. It's in her fanfiction writing blood. Hey, there's more to life than shipping. Don't you dare insult shipping in my presence! The slow development of Amity lowering her walls and acting more of herself around Luce, to the adorable and perhaps Disney groundbreaking reveal of Amity wanting to ask Luce out to Grom, confirming her feelings for the girl, was one of the biggest highlights of TV for me this year. The Grom episode was the definition of fun, and will easily be recognised by many fans as something that pushed the boundaries for what TV animation for kids can achieve. Talking about the Owl House without mentioning the animation and creative imagery that helps visualise this lovely show would absolutely be criminal. The show is filled to the brim with beautiful set pieces, stylised background designs, dynamic character poses, expressive storyboards, crafty prop design, hilariously drawn facial expressions and effective directing. All across the board, everyone involved really crafted something special. I mean, even the official commercial bumper that was created by Studio Golden Wolf is just bursting with this fun energy that makes the show look so enamoured with fluid animation due to the strong colours, flowing animation and eye-catching VFX explosions specifically helped by the works of Tony Unser. The background and set pieces in this show are so strongly captivating and work wonders at creating the depth and grimy feel of the Boiling Isles. The layouts perfectly find the balance of emitting the horrors that influenced the show's style, going back to Boss, Bauer and Varro. But they're illustrated and uniquely styled in a charismatic way that shows the intricate charms of the realm that also makes it feel so lived in. The background colour scheme also helps create this signature and recognisable look, having the rich colours of warm reds, oranges and browns balancing with the calming green, blue and purple hues. The colours emit this feeling of otherworldliness, but not too much to an extent it becomes too exaggerated, 
but instead offers beautiful glances and long shot pans of this fantasy world, or to highlight important scenes in the show, or to contrast against the colouring of the key characters or objects in the scene, so everything just flows smoothly and feels less jarring. Even many of the rough drafts or thumbnails gives an insight as to the thought processes of many scenes, whether that's developing on impactful shots, adjusting camera angles or poses, scribbling down the camera positions, exploring what the main focus of a shot should be, or how perspective grids are used. All these things that may seem tiny, but can take hours if not days of adjusting, revising and perfecting to make sure the final product is something they're proud of. Because when the final product looks like this, it's completely understandable why a lot of time, effort and teamwork is needed to pull something that looks so unbelievably charming and fixating come together. And not only for its fluid animation, but the hysterical character expressions that help make the jokes and laughs that much more effective, and help create visual gags and great meme-worthy pictures. And what better way to top it all off than to talk about the things you can't see in the show? With a cast of characters as eccentric as they are, it only makes sense that the voices behind the characters are just as lovable and obsessed with their characters as we are. I said I love her dress, I love her tooth, I love that little snaggle tooth sticking out. Um, no, I just fell in love with her the second I saw her. Putting their heart into helping create these characters that have become recognisable through their voices alone. Bringing their own little quirks and experiences to the roles to make them feel all the more authentic and captivating. I couldn't imagine any other characters being voiced by somebody else. Wendy Malik does a terrific job of voicing the snarky bad girl Ida. The way she can pull off mischief and sarcasm so well makes me love Ida all the more. But we were never caught because we're too slippery. Alex Hirsch is the perfect fit for playing the adorable, always commanding king. His tiny voice and slight immaturity makes me completely understand why Luce loves him so much. Soon, Mr. Ducky, we shall drink the fear of those who mocked us! I can't really say the same for his voice of this devil spawn of a character, though. Hoot! And of course, Luce herself being voiced by the talented Sarah Nicole Robles just completes this unlikely trio with her charismatic and expressive voice that helps to create this memeing childlike wonder of our favourite human. Aww, he's so dangly! Sadly, because of copyright reasons, I'm a little too cautious of playing any of the music that comes from the show, but TJ Hill has created such a lovely soundtrack for this charming series. From the recognisably upbeat opening that works so nicely with the animation, compared to the music for the ending, which is a calming, light, rhythmic score that allows audiences to breathe after all the fun and action, a lovely send-off to each episode. And then there's the music of everything and anything during the show. The score that caught my rounded human ears the most being the uplifting and literal magical score that plays during the dancing grom scene between Amity and Luce. A light instrumental that intensifies whilst Team Lumity dance their hearts out with the strings playing in the background. With all this rambling coming to an end, I think I just want to end this part of the video thanking the team behind the Owl House. It has relatable characters. I like editing anime clips to music and, and reading fantasy books with convoluted backstories. Beautiful animation, funky character designs, it's funny and adorable, and it has Ida, which no other show has, automatically putting it at the top. In all seriousness though, this show has been such a joy to watch and I can't wait to see more from the team, especially knowing season 2 has already been green lit. Thank you for watching, I may or may not have been a bit too distracted by the Grom episode which led to the delay of this video. I'll definitely make sure to put as many of the cast and crew's social media accounts as I can in the description, in case you want to take a peek at any of the sources I provided in the video, or to thank and support them yourselves. As always, if you're a fan of the Owl House like me, let me know in the comments. I'm literally the human equivalent of Hootie, so I could literally talk for days.